Okay, um, this is not this slide is not in your uh, your manual, but I I, I kind of called Kim in here last minute to speak on behalf of uh, the the incident management teams, the ICs, ops chiefs, uh, expectations of uh, uh, the incident commander. Uh, Kim is uh, the Merit Fire Zone uh, base manager officer for that center. Kim's also. Uh, out of Penticton, where I first met him back in way too long ago. Um, and I've worked on a number of fires with Kim, and it's really nice to walk into a room and you're familiar with the incident commander or the ops chief. It just brings a sense of calmness and understanding of where you fit within the organization. So when you have the opportunity at camp, find these guys and ask if you can join them for lunch if this doesn't break COVID protocols, because you're gonna gain a ton of information from these individuals and you're gonna make a relationship. So when you get out in the field one day and you recognize these guys, you're gonna have somebody to say hello to and get an update on. And uh, they're very approachable, uh, solid group of individuals. But Kim, I've asked here to come today and just speak about what an incident management team is, what the camp expectations are, leadership from IC, uh, and what, how the structure protection branch integrates into the incident management team and when and how they use them to uh, be deployed in the, in the field. Thanks for coming today, Kim. Appreciate it. Thank you. I'll give you this, okay? If you, yeah, I, we need it for recording. Thanks. You got to turn it on. So thanks, thanks, Larry, for, uh, for the opportunity to share. Um, One of the things that, uh, that I find really important to do at this point in my career is make sure that the knowledge and experiences that I have before I leave this organization and retire that I have an opportunity to share those experiences with people like yourselves that are coming up and, and want to be part of a successful organization. Um, so the incident command system for the province of British Columbia is, is going through um, what I will say a transitional uh, period where we've got an awful lot of new folks coming into the roles as incident commanders, operations section chiefs, logistics chiefs, and so on through the, the, uh, the entire uh, program and you need to know that and the reason you need to know that is because when you roll up to an incident and you've got somebody that is in a trainee position they're not going to maybe have all the knowledge that you're looking for and you need to know where to go to get that information so for all of you the question is how many of you use ICS on a regular basis all of you most of you because if you're not using ICS then you're going to be really struggling when you get out to an incident because that's all we use for managing an incident. We in the province of British Columbia uh, and BC Wildfire Service, um, you'll see us on fires, you'll see us on floods, and we're moving towards other hazards as well within the program, which means that uh, you guys will all be part of that as well. Because within our own, organ or our own organization, we don't have the capabilities to be able to pull in, uh, you know, mass numbers of people just because there aren't that many of us. So the incident command system and, and our incident management teams, currently we have six incident management teams for the province of British Columbia. Um, and each one of those teams uh, has a number of trainees uh, on the teams in different functions. So you're going to have varying experiences. Um, the, the biggest thing for me that I want to emphasize about all of the incidents that we come out to is safety. And it's safety of everybody. The people responding is our first priority. Making sure that all responders it's our number one thing. The, the safety of responders is not going to be compromised for any reason. And if you ever get to a situation where you feel like that is not the case, then it's your responsibility to put your hand up, speak up, and say, hey, hold on a second here. I'm not comfortable with what's going on. But safety is paramount for all the incidents, whether it's fires, floods, tsunamis, whatever it is that we're going to be dealing with, that, uh, that, that you feel comfortable that your safety is being looked after. Um, the other part of it for me for the incident command side of things and, and kind of into uh, IC expectations 
is understanding and knowing your job. What are you going as? And I use the analogy of an actor. So an actor takes on a role and they play that role while they're doing the movie or whatever it is that they're taking part in. But when they're finished that movie, they go back to being themselves. So in your regular jobs, you know the jobs that you're going to be going and doing each day. You know you're going to go and you're going to work in the hall and you're going to you know, work on the trucks or you're going to be training or whatever it is that you're going to be doing there because that's what you're familiar with. The minute you come out to a wildfire incident, it's going to challenge you as an individual to play that role. So you have to kind of put a mind switch on go, okay, I'm no longer a firefighter one. I'm actually now in charge of an engine company and that is my role. So I have to play that role. So you need to understand what it is that you're going to be taking on for that role and where you fit within the organization. And that's where the confusion comes in for a lot of folks that come out to wildfire, even some of our folks. They don't quite get where they're supposed to be fitting in. And the incident command system is very clear. It's very easy to follow. And you should know that you only ever have one boss. And that one boss is not the incident commander. The one boss is the person you report directly to. So yes, you might be getting information from an incident commander as he says, okay, he's setting tactic strategies and, and you know, what it is that we want to do to try and, and maintain uh, the integrity of the incident. But I'll, I'll tell you right now, the role of the incident commander has changed in my time in the program from one of being, you know, worrying about um, the, the tactics and strategies to being more of a politician and dealing with all the naysayers that don't like the way that we're doing business. So it just makes it a lot easier for the incident commander in knowing that everybody that is out there has their role and they are playing it so that they understand exactly what it is they're supposed to be doing. That's critical for success for all of us. The other part for me that, uh, um, that I really want to make sure is that you understand that it's not about you, it's about us. It's a collective group of us that the public is looking at. So yes, you might be structure protection, but who's going to wear it if things go sideways? It's going to be the BC Wildfire Service and as part of the BC Wildfire Service, that is the collective we or us. So you're part of that. So when Larry talks about you know, expectations for showing up at camp and making sure that there's no drugs, no alcohol um, that are being utilized, that uh, you adhere to the, the protocols for, uh, for COVID and all the stuff that, that is expected of us, that you do that because the public isn't going to differentiate between BC Wildfire Service and the engines that are out there. We're all responding to the same incident. So just keep that in mind that it's about, you know, all of us. Um, there was a couple of things that I had a bit of a chuckle about, and, and Lou, you know, Larry always picks on you, but I could pick on Larry quite easily, but I won't. Um, knowing where you're going. So there's a lot of, of, of stories out there over the past years where engine companies from got on a ferry, got across the, uh, the water, got to the mainland, started traveling up to, let's call it Dee's Lake for conversation's sake, get there and realize that they weren't even asked for. Or that that was not where they're supposed to be going. So it's critical that you understand that you know exactly where you're going. The, the guys have done a great job of putting together 
an information package about pre-deployment. What do you need to know? Where am I going? What are the fuels? What kind of fire behavior are we dealing with? What's the size of the community? What political issues might we be dealing with? All those kinds of things you need to do before you even get in the truck and start rolling, on, rolling your wheels. Because it'll help you to be successful once you get to the site. Camp expectations. Actually, is there, is there any comments or, or questions uh, so far? Okay, perfect. Camp expectations. You can only imagine with COVID and what it's done to our camps and the way in which we view using camps, um, it's gonna be a challenge. Yes, we are in the process of trying to determine uh, how we can have a camp uh, COVID coordinator that is a separate safety officer from the, the regular safety officer that goes out and looks at the field operation stuff, um, have a, a COVID coordinator available to us to manage COVID because it's a huge task. Our camps, we've gone through, um, as a program, we've gone through all the different uh, business areas within our program and put the COVID lens on everything we do. And the amount of impacts that COVID has, has placed on us is, has been enormous. Um, we've, we've gotten to the point where camps for us will be a single tent with a single person in it and then the kitchens and all that sort of stuff, the meals in which they provide will be done in a different way. It, it won't be your get, you know, go through the end of the kitchen uh, trailer and uh, do your, you know, the kind of the smorg thing and, and uh, wander on through. That's not how it's gonna be done. So be flexible and, and yeah, make sure that you've got your 48 hours worth of provisions available to you because it might be somewhat uh, interesting when you show up and you go, oh, hold on a second, I was expecting I was gonna have a regular BCWS uh, camp set up. It's not gonna be that this year. In fact, um, the option for a full old school kind of camp is our last resort. We'll only do that if we absolutely have to. Everything else is gonna be done uh, differently this year with regards to camps. So just be prepared for that. Um, so, you know, I talked a bit about leaders intent, um, ICS and, uh, the structure protection. So does everybody know where exactly you report to on an incident in the ICS, uh, world? Okay. So when you show up at the incident, you're going to check in through the plan section. And then once you are at that incident, you become an operational um, person for the incident. So then you report to the ops chief. So when we, when we mix terminology about, you know, you guys talk about uh, two IC, that's your term. There's only one IC on a wildfire incident. So it's kind of your, your second in command for your structure side of things. So if you've, if you've got somebody that is a 2IC under the structure side of things, um, I would call them either a task force leader, a strike team leader, or a replacement instead of a 2IC because it just confuses people. There is only one IC on a wildfire incident. The other thing you have to keep in mind too is that our IC or command post might be roving for the first few days of the incident. So it's not like a structure fire where you throw, you, you, you go out uh, the hall and you show up on, uh, you know, second and main to a, uh, a, a structure that's on fire. You just, you establish command and it stays there. Ours doesn't. Ours might be in a helicopter flying over top of uh, the stuff. The incident commander will be in there looking at stuff. And just keep that in mind that it's not something that's fixed until we get well established and then we'll have our camp set up um, and then we'll have our incident command post in place and that's usually where the incident commander works out of. Um, I don't really have a whole lot more to add. Uh, is there anything else, uh, Larry, that you can think of that, uh, that you wanted me to touch on? But, uh, you know, generally speaking, um, I think the evolution of where we are now 
to where we were in the first part of my career. It's, it's leaps and bounds ahead of where we were. And, and you know, the, the steps that we're making uh, to move towards a more efficient model, um, we're, we're really close to, to having that nailed right down. Um, I had the opportunity this last fall to go down to the United States and work in Oregon for uh, a month and uh, see how things went down there. And the way they do things down there, uh, we're getting pretty close to that same kind of model. Um, there's a few tweaks that, uh, that we like to say we're, we're BCIzing stuff. But uh, generally speaking, um, you know, we're, we're getting pretty efficient with the way in which we integrate structure protection and the structure branch side of things into our operational uh, uh, world with, uh, with BC Wildfire Service. So um, to Larry and, uh, and Brent and Chad, thanks very much for, uh, for the opportunity and, and the work you guys have done to, uh, to develop this curriculum. Um, like I say, it's, uh, it's far better than, than what we've had in the past and, and only look forward to, uh, to moving forward. Matt, have you got a question? Yeah, so the question is, is how, how beneficial is it for um, the integration, integration of uh, the BC Wildfire Zone offices and the municipal fire departments? It's huge. Um, developing those relationships pre-incident, uh, um, it, it, like Larry mentioned a couple times, you just feel comfortable. You know that, hey, you know, like, um, you show up and you see Joel and you go, oh, hey, I know, I know Joel, I know what his capabilities are, I know where he fits in the organization. We've had conversations on training and, uh, and cross-training events, huge. If, that's probably one of the biggest things that I would recommend is that you know, each one of the fire departments reach out to the local zone office and develop those relationships because doing it prior to an incident makes it a whole lot more efficient and a lot more comfortable than doing it at the incident when you got fire on the landscape and you're trying to figure out exactly who's going to play what roles. Thanks for that, Matt. Any other questions or comments? All right. Larry, thanks, thanks very Kim. much. I appreciate it. Thank you very much, Kim. Okay, so we're closing up so, uh, the summary on uh, the deployment session here. Um, pretty clearly, you are a structural firefighting, uh, a firefighter protecting values at risk. Um, you will function as part of a larger tactical movement, uh, formation and role, and knowing your roles and responsibility are critical uh, based on uh, what you will learn in this course today and in the field. You have to be completely self-sufficient at least for 48 hours, be flexible, be innovative, and have discipline, understand leaders' intent, um, and know your systems, right? Know your, your accountability check-ins. Uh, you will learn this on day two also, as we will do an actual check-in procedure and a demo procedure in day two. Uh, but having the drawdown, having the appropriate paperwork, knowing where you're going, as, as Kim said, uh, crucially important. Um, and the, at the end of the day, like, at every structure fire we do, at every incident we respond to in municipal world, everybody goes home safely. That is our end game. That's our main goal. Um, I uh, thank you for your, your, your time today. And, um, and this is the end of session one. I'd like just to ask the Chad and Brent if they have anything to add. And OK, uh, why don't we take a break? Uh, for those of you at home, uh, you'll be able to access your quiz online now. You write the quiz, and then you'll be able to move into session two. Thank you.